So let me take another cut at uh, you know, why we're here today, what we're here to discuss. We'd ultimately like to use the tools of modern neuroscience, and in particular the one I'm most familiar with, of course, and that's brain imaging, to study the underlying physiology, uh, biology of acupuncture, to try to develop a comprehensive understanding of potential mechanisms, and then to use those mechanisms and that understanding to help us design better trials better suited to understanding the uh, potential role of acupuncture in the treatment of a wide range of conditions. Okay. Um, so, uh, why neuroimaging? How is it that we're approaching that? Let me take a little bit of a step back, uh, because I'm sure many of you are familiar with this, but perhaps others uh, may be less. Uh, why it is that we're using uh, neuroimaging as a particular way, not the only way, but a particularly powerful way to try to understand how the brain may be working uh, in the face of an acupuncture treatment. Uh, by way of analogy, we can think of a, a digital computer. And, uh, of course, uh, when we try to understand how a digital computer works in the same way we might try to understand how the brain works, it's important to realize, of course, that there are many different levels that we can approach uh, the questions. We can approach it uh, literally from the quantum mechanical level of how semiconductors work uh, through uh, how we build uh, integrated circuits, how we wire those circuits together, and ultimately how we get those circuits communicating uh, both uh, within themselves, within a single uh, uh, computer, for example, and in fact how we even uh, get those computers to talk to each other. Now, um, like uh, the brain, the computer has this large hierarchical system but I would maintain that if you really want to understand the details, say, of the quantum mechanics of uh, semiconductors, you really don't need to know very much about that, what uh, Bill Gates and his colleagues are doing on the software side. And vice versa, it's fair to say uh, that as brilliant as Bill is uh, on the software and network side, uh, he probably uh, can't describe the Hamiltonian of uh, spin-hole interactions in any great detail. There's probably no need to. So this is one of the reasons why I would maintain that the analogy with the human brain, while strong and compelling at one level, may somewhat break down and uh, obviously leading to wide neuroimaging. Because like uh, the computer, the brain also has its multiple levels from the molecular level to what's happening at the synapse to the physiology of single cells, multiple cells working together in columns, systems of uh, integrated uh, uh, neurons, all the way up, of course, to the sociology, to the interaction between these uh, computer units. And yet I maintain that, for example, you want to really understand, say, a sociological problem, say, uh, uh, substance abuse, drug addiction. There's really no fundamental way to make progress uh, in, in that at a fully comprehensive level if we don't understand the underlying molecular biology of what causes uh, addiction uh, in the brain and what subserves uh, the reward circuitry uh, involved in this uh, abnormal reinforcing function that it's just a requirement to understand the brain to integrate across multiple levels. And indeed, it's that challenge of moving across scales that imaging, I think, has its greatest role. Uh, in uh, animal systems, to some extent in humans, we, of course, can use invasive measures to measure everything from uh, the molecular biology up to cellular events. Uh, Non-invasively, uh, we can do a systems level, cognitive behavioral studies, uh, interact uh, with the brain. Uh, but we have a gap to bridge, and it's that gap that imaging is uh, so potentially useful at doing, both for its ability to image anatomy at scales that range from the cellular uh, all the way up to uh, the systems level uh, in vivo, uh, and uh, even more important because of its ability to, to uh, uh, provide functional measures, measures of biochemistry, measures of electrical activity, measures of uh, circuit function at multiple scales, that imaging has a way to potentially bridge the cellular with the systems level and allow us to make these comprehensive uh, connections across levels that I think we're going to need to understand uh, any uh, uh, fundamental uh, uh, cognitive function, of which uh, acupuncture effects may certainly be one. Now, uh, functional neuroimaging, is, of course, itself is not a single domain. Uh, there are many different technologies that have been uh, developed over the last uh, 30 years now, uh, which have had a profound effect on how we can uh, study the brain uh, in vivo, in humans, in our, in our patients, uh, as well as in uh, uh, basic studies of uh, neurobiology. They include things like uh, MEG and EEG, things that allow us to measure uh, rapid uh, transient electrical dynamics uh, in the brain, transcutaneous magnetic stimulation, a way to stimulate focal parts of the brain uh, in vivo. Uh, and then to correlate those measures with uh, recordings that you can make uh, 
uh, in a more invasive setting, say during the time of surgery. Um, optical imaging, another uh, domain that I won't uh, talk about, but which is becoming increasingly important because of its ability uh, to image uh, uh, populations that are very hard to image with uh, other technologies like magnetic resonance, in particular small children or uh, very sick uh, patients in the neurointensive care unit. But uh, the technologies that I'll talk about today are basically uh, magnetic resonance imaging and functional magnetic resonance imaging uh, and positron emission tomography. Uh, and they are connected uh, through the wonderful uh, high-resolution anatomy that uh, magnetic resonance uh, can provide. Essentially, it's uh, the linchpin that connects all of these different modalities and provides a common anatomical framework for us to understand uh, uh, all the different kinds of function that we can learn using these tools.